So let's start this video with a theorem. We talked last time about uh, positive definite matrices. That was what you saw in the video, and we saw what's going on with two by two uh, matrices. Let's start with a symmetric n by n matrix K. So any square symmetric matrix. I'll just give you the criterion for what it, what it means for K to be positive definite. So the big theorem is the following. K is positive definite if and only if K is a regular matrix. We know what a regular matrix is. And whenever you write K as an LU, right, as a lower triangular, special lower triangular times an upper triangular, that matrix U has all positive pivots. So a symmetric matrix is one that has no row interchanges and in its LU decomposition. Uh, okay, so let's just look at this. So 2, 1, 1, 1. When I uh, row reduce that, um, the matrix that I get is 2, 1, 0, 1 half. And look, those two pivots are po positive. So this is enough to guarantee that this is a positive definite matrix. So again, no row exchanges that were necessary to make this happen first. And second, all the pivots were positive. Fantastic. Let's see a non-example really quick. So if I had looked at 1, 1, 1, 0, all the entries are positive, but when I do the row reduction, the matrix that I get looks like 1, 1, 0, minus 1. And that's, so I have a regular matrix, but because one of the pivots is negative, even though there were no row, row exchanges required, and all my pivots are non zero, so my matrix is regular and non singular, it's not positive definite. Because it, it has a negative pivot. Okay. So, in short, the bottom one is not positive definite because it has a negative pivot in its LU decomposition. And the top one is positive definite because all the pivots are positive. All right, so let's talk about some of the applications to minimization that we can do with positive definite matrices. Um, and just to talk sort of generally about what good minimization is. Minimization principles are sort of ubiquitous throughout physics and engineering is a very common thing to do because systems tend to seek the lowest energy state uh, and those are called uh, stable equilibrium points or positions. So circuits seek the, the lowest power and physical systems like a pendulum for example is going to seek the, the lowest position. Actually there's a stable equilibrium point at the very top if you invert the pendulum if it has a stiff um, swinger arm. Uh, but it's, it's not stable, is it? A uh, tiny little nudge will knock it back down. Uh, but so circuits, uh, they need the lowest, lowest power. Um, this goes on and on. Minimal, lots of physical things obey minimal principles. Also, uh, you've been doing minimization problems in math for a couple of years now, and we can maybe get some new insights, some algebraic insights into old problems that we already know some techniques for solving uh, using this idea of positive definiteness. So before we do that, I think it's a good idea if we look, um, well, let's give another application. So let's look at solving AX equals B, where A is some M by N matrix. So you know how to do that. You would use Gaussian elimination. But if I think about it another way, I can define a function from Rn to R. It takes a vector x. And what it does is it computes the norm of Ax minus b, or maybe the norm squared, depending on, well, so, or maybe the norm squared. So, well, if Ax equals b has a solution, so if Ax equals b has a solution, 
well, then the norm, then P of X um, is zero at that solution. So this function, which is non-negative, would actually have a zero. That's good. It would have to be a global minimum. If it has lots of solutions, then it would have lots of global minimums. On the other hand, if AX equals B doesn't have a solution, well, P still has a global minimum, or might. And that global minimum is called a least squares solution. Least squares solution to the problem AX equals B. It's an approximation to the AX equals B. Okay, so let's talk about this in a slightly different way. What if I gave you a subspace of RM and a point in RM? Uh, so a, a subspace of RM and a point there. Um, you could ask, what's the minimum distance between that point B and the subspace? Well, to think about that question, um, a good idea very frequently, if you're thinking about subspaces in particular, is to grab a basis for the subspace. So suppose I had a basis, V1 through Vk. Let's say that V is k-dimensional subspace of Rm. Um, then do the following. Make a matrix whose columns consist of that basis. So in the first column, you put the vector V1, in the second column, V2, and so on. All the way to the last column, you put Vk. Then, well, Every vector in V is a unique linear combination of the V1 through Vk's, and that's exactly what it means for V1 through Vk to span V, uh, and it's a basis, so the combination is unique. But those are columns of A, because that's what I just made A out of. And remember that when I multiply that matrix times a vector, I'm really taking that linear combination. So every V and V is of the form A times X for some, in fact, unique X in RM. In short, the, the subspace V is, is exactly the range of A. Uh, but now all we have to do is minimize the norm of AX minus B, because all the V's are AX's. We're just Minimize that over all possible x in Rm. So before we do that, and we're going to look much more at that in section uh, 4.3 as we move forward, but first uh, let's think about minimization and let's minimize just a single quadratic in one variable. Uh, let me grab a p of x that looks like ax squared plus 2bx plus c, and you'll see why we make that 2. The numbers are going to come out a little bit better if we make it a 2bx. So the first method that we'll do is the one that you probably learned in calculus class. We'll just take the derivative. So p prime of x is 2ax plus 2b. And how can that be 0? Let's see, I guess that means that 2ax is minus 2b, and so x looks like minus b over a. OK, fine. And that means that the, oh well, if you plug that into p, uh, you'll find you get c minus b squared over a. Okay, so you have, uh, is that a min or a max or what? Well, p double prime is 2a. Okay, so that means that this minus b over a is a minimizer if your parabola points upward. And that means that a has to be positive. Okay, fine. So you'll note that this is only we've only proven that it's a local min for p. Uh, we'll need to do a little more analysis to find out that it's a global min. But in the algebraic setting, well, we're just going to complete the square. And you'll see that completing the square gives you a sort of nicer solution. So when you complete the square on p, what do you find? You find a times x plus b over a all squared plus the term like c minus b squared, oh, ac minus b squared over a, which is exactly c minus b squared over a, which was that minimum value we saw before. 
Um, well, if you look at the squared term here, that's non-negative, and it's zero exactly when x is equal to minus b over a. That's as small as it could be if a is positive. And this other term, ac minus b squared over a, doesn't depend on x at all. So the smallest I can make this be, as I vary x, as long as a is positive, is going to be minus b over a. Okay, fantastic. It's a global min. That, that, right, completing the square shows me that I have a global min, as long as a is a positive number. And the minimum value, well, plug in x equals minus b over a, and there it is, ac minus b squared over a. That's the same as c minus b squared over a, so great. So why did we go through that? Well, it's going to offer some insight into how we do more general quadratics. So if I look like p, if I look at p of x1 through xn, and let's just call that a vector x, as a summation, say, kij, xi, xj, where kij are some scalars, and, and take the summation over i and j, ranging from 1 to n, minus, I'm going to put the minus 2 here for the same reason I put it in the one variable quadratic, summation of fi times xi's, where fi's are again scalars, and xi's are my variables, plus a constant. Now, this first term encodes every possible quadratic term I could have in P. Yeah, because I could equal j, so I could have an xi square, or, or I could have some xi times some xj. So it keeps, it keeps all my quadratic terms uh, in one place. Uh, and this second term uh, that I've got highlighted in blue gives me all possible linear terms. Uh, fi's are just numbers, so this gives me all the linear terms I could have. And let me just throw in a constant. This is a very general quadratic polynomial in several variables. Uh, and I'm going to keep this minus 2 out here, and it's going to be useful for my theorem at the end of the day. It makes all my numbers come out nicer. And it makes it so, well, it makes it so that my theorem is beautiful. So we're going to keep the minus 2. Now, we're going to assume something that you might think that we can't assume. And there's a homework problem that I'll assign that makes it more clear. But we're, I'm going to assume that these kij's are equal to the kji's. So what's true is that you can always assume this without any loss of generality, that every polynomial can be written cleverly uh, this way, so that your k is, a, is actually a symmetric matrix, k being the, the matrix full of these numbers kij's. So what we're going to do with this p of x1 through xn is look for a global minimum. Hopefully it'll have one. There might be some condition. It's not so clear. Uh, we don't have like a leading coefficient like we had a before, but we're going to look for a global min over all of rn, just like we were looking for a global min over all of r before. But by the way, um, the reason that we're going to spend a lot of time working over all of rn instead of looking for a global min over some subspace of some subset, is that doing this analysis over sub proper subspaces is a lot more convoluted um, without maybe being instructive. So those constrained problems uh, are topics for maybe for a, a later course. So let me start by writing my long polynomial there in a more compact form. So I'm going to write x transpose kx, where x is my long list of variables x1 through xn, minus 2 x transpose f, f being the vector containing all of the fi's, plus a constant. So here again, k is the matrix kij's, and f is a vector full of the linear terms f1 through fn, the scalars in the linear terms. So before, the requirement for my single variable polynomial to have a global minimum, what was it? It was that a, the leading coefficient, be positive. OK, that's good. We've known that since calculus. Well, the requirement now for this p of x is that k, the quadratic leading term, if you like, be a positive definite matrix. This is a much more subtle condition. 
so it's kind of awesome that this is the theorem. Uh, well, in short, what does K have to be? K needs to be, we're going to assume, a symmetric matrix. It's going to need to be regular. And it's going to need to have positive pivots once I put it into upper triangular form with reduction. So those conditions that it be a regular matrix with positive pivots um, and symmetric, that's key. That's what makes us be able to minimize this. So again, start with this p of x is x transpose kx minus 2x transpose f plus c. And I'll just state the theorem. The proof is straightforward, and we can discuss it in class if you like. It says if k is a positive definite matrix, then p of x does have, in fact, a unique global minimum. And that global minimum is kind of easy to find, too. So the global minimizer, the value of x, and I'm going to write x tilde uh, to indicate that I have a, a minimizer. That, that x tilde is, def is determined by Gaussian elimination. All you have to do is solve the equation k x tilde equals f. So, more than that, I can tell you the minimum value that p takes. There are a lot of expressions for this, but I think the easiest one to compute uh, that takes the least uh, processor time is, I don't know why I wrote p there. Well, p of x tilde, and that's c minus x, well, f transpose x tilde. That's it. OK, so we're going to get some practice now. Suppose that I start with this quadratic. P of xy is 2x squared plus 3y squared plus 2xy minus 2x minus 8y plus 3. I'm going to put this into matrix form, and we'll talk in a minute about how I went about doing this. But it's just xy times the matrix 2, 1, 1, 3 times xy again, row, then matrix, then column, minus 2 times xy times the f is 1, 4, plus 3. So you can verify for yourself that that's correct, that when you do those multiplications out, you'll get p back. But if you look at this matrix k, it is indeed positive definite. Mm, why? You should go through and pause the video and check that this is a positive definite matrix. It should only take a second. So the minimum value is just, or the minimizer is x tilde, we said. And that's found by solving k times x tilde equals f, f being 1, 4. So that just means I need to row reduce a matrix. The matrix is going to be 2, 1, 1, 3. And then I augment with the column of f, that's 1, 4. So when I row reduce this and I find a solution, I'll just write down what the solution was. So my x tilde ends up being exactly minus 1 fifth, 7 fifths, which is maybe not the most beautiful number in the world, but it's certainly not something you would have found by guessing and checking. And the minimum value is also easy to find. You just take 3, that was the constant term, minus f, that's 1 4, times the minimizer, minus 1 fifth, 7 fifths. And when you compute what that is, you get 3 minus 27 fifths, or minus 2.4. So the smallest that polynomial could possibly be is minus 2.4. There's a unique global minimum. And we found where we can minimize it. Now, you could do this with multivariate calculus. In fact, you've been asked to before in your multivariate calculus class. But what you needed to do was to analyze the Hessian matrix. And what did you need the Hessian matrix to be? You needed the Hessian matrix to be positive definite. So really, the calculus methods are actually the algebra methods. 
So let's talk for a second um, about how I got that matrix form. So if I just multiply xy times a symmetric matrix a, b, b, c times xy again, well, if you multiply it out, you get a x times ax plus by plus y times bx plus cy, which if you foil, I guess that's not even foiling, if you multiply that out, you get ax squared, you get cy squared, and you get 2bxy. So that means that any polynomial that looks like something times x squared plus something else times y squared plus some multiple of xy, you can write in matrix form in exactly that way. Uh, similarly, if you write down the 3 by 3 case, and I'll m make my symmetric matrix be ABC, BDE, CEF, then if you count up all the x squared terms, well, there's only an AX squared, there's a DY squared, and there's an FZ squared, so the diagonal entries are being the quadratic, uh, the pure quadratic terms. And then the B is your XY term, but with a 2. The C is your XZ term, but with a 2. And the E is your YZ term, but with a 2. So this pattern continues uh, in the general n by n setting which is going to let you write all of your quadratic terms as, as if they had come from a matrix, a symmetric matrix. That is the point. So, great. Uh, as if it had come from a symmetric matrix. So let's do one more example. Uh, suppose I start with a three-variable quadratic. Uh, x squared plus 6y squared plus 22z squared plus 4xy minus 12yz minus 2x plus 2y plus 12. So the x squared gives me a 1 in the upper left corner. The y squared, the 6y squared gives me a 6 in the center entry. And the 22z squared gives me a 22 in that bottom right entry. Uh, and now I look, uh, that 4xy gives me a 2 in the 1, 2 position and also in the 2, 1 position because it's a symmetric matrix. And if I look for an xz term, I don't see one, so I guess that's a zero. And if I look for the yz term, uh, it's just minus six coming from that minus 12 there. You just take that and divide by two, and you stick it in the corresponding entry. That's how I come up with a matrix for this polynomial. Uh, and then that's times xyz in a column. Now, let's see, minus 2, I've got to factor a 2 out to make my numbers come out. So that's x, y, z times, well, there's no z term, so I guess that's going to be a 0, and if I factor out a 2, it's 1 and minus 1. Okay. And plus 12, that's a constant. Well, if you look at this matrix for long enough and stare at it and row reduce it, you'll discover that you have a positive definite matrix again. Well, in fact, I'll just give you the decomposition since you've proven on your exam that you know how to find them. So the decomposition for a symmetric matrix is nice, right? The, you get an L times a V, or times a di you get a lower, special lower triangular times a diagonal times a special upper triangular, which is just the transpose of your lower triangular. So it looks like this. And the diagonal entries here are all positive, which corresponds exactly to the pivots. If you just did an LU decomposition, pivots all being positive. So you have a minimizer, and it's a unique global minimizer because you have a positive definite matrix of quadratic coefficients. And all you do is solve the equation kx equals f. And in, that, that, in this case, that means you solve 1, 2, 0, 2, 6, minus 6, 0, minus 6, 22, times x, so I guess x tilde 1, x tilde 2, x tilde 3, that should equal 1 minus 1, 0. So we know how to do that. Row reduce. Do Gaussian elimination. You will find that x tilde is, it's not great, minus 35 halves, minus 33 fourths, and minus 9 fourths. Again, not something you would find by guess and check. And so that's the unique minimizer of this function. The smallest this function can be is its value at this point. And what is the minimum value? 
Again, we're going to get some practice computing it. All you do is you take the constant term and subtract off the minimizer times f. So it's 12 minus and the vector x tilde times f was 1 minus 1, 0. And if you do that arithmetic, you find that the minimum possible value is minus 55 fourths. Again, you could do this by calculus, but it would be tedious and actually depend on the same techniques in the end. So, summary for the day. If k is a positive definite matrix, then you get a unique global minimizer of this polynomial, this x transpose kx plus, say, x, time, x transpose f plus a constant. You get a unique global minimizer when, a, when k is positive definite. I don't know how to spell unique. OK, great. And the minimum value is easy to compute. If a if rather if k is only positive semi-definite, well, you no longer have a unique global minimizer, but you do have global mins. The point is that the kernel of k is you can you can shift any minimizer by something in the kernel and find the same minimum value. So it's no longer unique. You have infinitely many minimums but they're all the same minimum. Uh, and if you're not even positive semi-definite, then there's really nothing you can do. It's kind of like a multi-dimensional version of looking for a minimum on a quadratic that's pointed uh, down. So you don't, you're not guaranteed to have a global minimum at all if you're not positive semi-definite.